Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Over the years, I've reviewed a great many games. And over the years, I have called many different games crap or terrible. Only come to find out they were actually really good. Wolfenstein 2009 is one such game. That is a game that I thought was complete garbage until I actually played it all the way through and found it was actually a hidden masterpiece in many respects. And of course I said much the same about Resident Evil 1 and things of that nature. But let's face it ladies and gentlemen, there are some games that when you give it a second chance, well, you gave it a second chance to be crap. Rage. First released in 2011, I considered it complete crap without ever playing it. And then when I finally got the game, I could never get the gutty thing to work. And then, when I finally got the goddamn thing to work, I felt it was completely boring and not worth my time. But then, in 2020, I thought I'd finally give that gutty thing a chance. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you can't get them all right. So with that, let's hop in. Rage is one of those games where it's so bad that even EA apologists at the time couldn't really say too much good about it. First, we must establish context for this game. Rage was developed by the mighty id Software and published by Bethesda Softworks in the far off days of 2011. Keep in mind, there had not been a real id Software game since 2003. There were a smattering of forgotten mobile titles that do not bear thinking about. As of 2011, we had been told that there was a Doom coming just around the corner and then Rage was announced. Instead of the long-awaited sequel to Doom 3, we instead were going to get a post-apocalyptic game with vehicular combat. Talk about subverting expectations. This was a rather odd move for id Software as there were already two popular post-apocalyptic games on the market at that time. You had Fallout and Borderlands. And this game inevitably was going to be compared to both games, even if the comparison was a bit unfair to say the least. And let's face it, the fans of id Software didn't want a post-apocalypse game, they wanted goddamn doom hell on earth! Joke's on us! We had to wait nine years for that! One must also keep in mind the first-person shooter gaming landscape as of the mid-2000s. You generally had regenerative health, then you had limited weapon loadouts, basic level design, which were essentially hallways, and let's not forget the cinematic concepts applied to a gaming genre that was more about player interaction than watching the pretty screen. So, what in the name of the great John Carmack is Rage anyway, and why did it fall off the radar so quickly compared to other id Software games? It is a first-person shooter set in a post-apocalyptic hellscape with vehicular combat that is almost optional. You play as Rageroid, the one-man army filled with steroids and rage! You have a regenerative health system, BOO! With the ability to come back to life with a second win mechanic! Double BOO! The second win mechanic in Borderlands was actually, you know, good. You had to kill an enemy to come back to life. Here you just play a super dull minigame and presto, you are back up and killing. At least you can carry all your weapons at one time, and the weapons are, at the very least, somewhat fun to shoot. These weapons, instead of being paragons of death-dealing destruction, are more like this. Well, actually, no, that's not particularly fair to the old MMP40 here. At least this has some character. Oh, these weapons are gonna suck, aren't they? Oh, they suck, and they blow. A a actually, no, they, they don't do uh, neither. Rather, they are the most generic bullet shooters this side of a game from 2010, which is absolutely fitting. The only somewhat cool gun is the Settler Pistol, and it's as nonsensical as that bloody Thunderstruck Volley Fire Revolver. This pistol is actually a revolver that, you guessed it, uses interchangeable cylinders and is a top break. It does okay damage against weaker enemies, and when used with heavier projectiles, can surprisingly be used later into the game. You can increase the versatility of the revolver by getting a scope for it. Now, how does one mount a scope on a revolver? Well, what you do is, you don't mount it on the revolver, you hold it up to your eye and shoot with the revolver! Wait... Um, it's the Feltrite! This may be completely nonsensical, but it's good for longer range attacks, and it's good even late game. The shotgun is lacking in any character at all, and works as you would expect, but it is fun to blow enemies across a room, I suppose. A bloody AK. 
that's the best the mighty id software could come up with a bloody kalash and the rifle is mirrored so it looks even dumber this is your go-to weapon until you get the evil assault rifle that uses the same animations and reloading sounds as the smg in doom 3 and is a giant mass of boring pixels but I suppose it's still not that bad, and at least it's fun enough to use against medium to long range enemies. You then got the Rocket Launcher. No lawn chair status for you. It's a tube for rockets that is very tactabro. Unfortunately, this is where we get into another aspect of the game that is rather crap. This game has piss poor hit detection. Here is one of the few impressive enemies in the game. It should theoretically be a very fun boss fight. Unfortunately, it is not. You try to plug its quivering hole with your rocket of great justice, only for it to never actually hit. Hmm, could it be the hit detection is way off and takes what should be a fairly fun boss fight and turns it into a boring, tedious slog where you have to rely upon splash damage to kill this bastard. Then you get a crossbow, and this works well enough when you have to face armored enemies. However, it's not altogether that useful throughout the base gameplay and will primarily just sit there gathering dust. I have to say the design, while not particularly inspired, at least shows some effort. You get mind control bolts that somehow are supposed to let you control people's minds. Unfortunately, I never got those to work and ended up just blowing up enemies with it. It does work in certain circumstances where you need a one hit kill, but these circumstances are very few and far between. Then you got the sniper. It's just as boring as any other sniper in any other game. The chain gun. It's got at the very end of the game and works like a chain gun should. But the alternate ammo just makes me sad. Unfortunately in Rage, BFG is just an alternate ammo for a boring chain gun. Look upon this and weep. The BF fucking G doesn't even get a new animation. I mean, really, how lazy is this? You got grenades. Yay. And then the wing stick. I could use a few death sticks right about now. And no, I don't want to go home and rethink my life. Thank you very much. The wing sticks are little boomerangs that are way OP and good even late game. Because when I think of it software weapons, I think of boomerangs being the ultimate weapon of great justice. Admittingly, they are fun enough and can be used to one-shot armored enemies. The game also features numerous ammo types for your weapons. Really though, you don't need to use these all together that much unless you're having difficulty in certain areas. And there were times when facing armored enemies that I didn't even notice that I was using regular ammo when I thought I was using armor piercing ammo, as it seems to only take a few less shots when using armor piercing versus standard ammo. In addition to shooting, you'll also be doing some RPG things. Yes, the RPG mechanics are even more stripped down than Fallout 4's. You don't have XP or anything like that, but rather you level up by getting more powerful cars and weapons. There are a few bits of crafting here and there, original, and there is even some inventory management. The most rpg element is the fact that you can pick up a few quests here and there, and you need to buy certain things in shops. The RPG-ish stuff will make the game somewhat bearable until you reach the end, as it is immersive enough to lull you into a false sense of security. The car racing, ladies and gentlemen. Did you know the game has two currency systems? One in dollars, I guess you can't keep a good fed down, and racing certificates. Yeah, this is another form of legal tender in the wasteland. Sure, you need to race to get racing certificates, to get new cars, and upgrades to existing cars. This is surprisingly fun, as this is one of the few areas of the game where you feel like you're actually progressing. The racing itself has some pretty good spectacle, but it's not that hard, and like everything else, it's just a letdown at the end of the game, and has no real story purpose. You just do it to reach other locations in the super small game world. It's not like you have to battle against a rival racer, and then have the rival racer team up with you to take down Mr. Big at the end. Oh, and there's no final boss at the end of the game. 
Spoilers! Most of the game will have you killing enemies and taking names, and the enemies do have a decent variety to them, with my favorite being the Mother Rajans. They have 12 inches of steel plate welded to their faces, and they take a bunch of hits to take down. The game does have big guys here and there, and they can be a minor challenge. I'm just glad it didn't go full Infinity Ward and have nothing but generic foot soldiers. The game, as mentioned earlier, has optional side quests, but they are either A. Boring or B. Boring. A good example of this is this quest here. You have to get a magic flower for a dude! You hop in your rage wagon right out to the blood swamps, and then a colossal swamp beast rises from the depths and... Okay, I might have been exaggerating just a bit. There was no colossal swamp beast. Instead, you ride out to the blood swamps and pick a flower and return home safely. Expectation subverted. Seriously, it's more dangerous for me to go to HEB to get a six pack of Dr. Peppers than it is to get this goddamn flower. Did they forget to program in an enemy here? I mean, really, what in the name of Romero happened here? I pondered this little conundrum for the past month, and I finally came upon a determination. What if Rage was never meant to be a first-person shooter at all, and instead what we have here is the stitched together remnants of a failed MMO? First, let's look at the way the game is structured. You have several distinct areas with a few quests and respawning enemies. You cannot reach each area unless you have a proper vehicle. Seems awfully like a leveling system was supposed to be implemented. The game's currency is another hint as well. You have two types of money, dollars that you get from every trash mob, and racing certificates that have to be earned in races to get car parts and new cars. The racing itself is so out of place and has so little to do with the game as a whole that I theorize that this was supposed to have been a PvP game mode, and that the racing certificates would have been a premium currency, earned by winning PvP matches. Or by opening the old wallet and dumping money directly into the game. You then have the cars themselves. The vast majority of the game takes place on foot, and the vehicular combat, when it's there, feels really tacked on. I get the feeling that the cars were to have been some sort of mount system, in addition to being used in PvP arenas. And likely what would have happened is this, you would have gotten your first car for free, but then you would have had to either buy more with premium currency, or purchase one with real money, or possibly earn less crappy ones by completing missions. The missions themselves also feel like MMO missions. You are always collecting X number of things, or driving to a mission area and doing X, and then driving right back to a hub. This might seem somewhat similar to gameplay seen in the latter day Fallout games, but it is very much lacking, even when compared to those games. And when you compare this to a traditional RPG, yeah, I would say... Come on! Even Fallout Boar does quests better! The crafting is such an afterthought that I feel that this was cut from a much more involved system that would have allowed you to craft rare items with resources that would have been hard to acquire or purchased with premium currency. The ammo also has the stench of the MMO as well. You don't need armor piercing ammo to kill armored enemies. It just makes it a whole bunch easier. Better open up that wheel of a wallet and spin, 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 ladies and gentlemen. The weapons also feel generic enough to be understandable to most players, and thus ripe for mastery by pro MLGs. In addition to the races, there is another area that feels like a PvE zone. Mutant Bash TV. This has absolutely no bearing on the overall story, and you don't ever have any real reason to go back to it, and this feels like a place where players could band together to take on increasingly difficult waves of enemies to earn levels or premium currency. The Feltrite. This is a magical rock that can be picked up for regular dollars. Sometimes when driving, there will be Feltrite storms where you have to pick up as much as possible in a time limit for regular dollars. I get the feeling that this was to be a currency for rare weapons or possibly some sort of improved armor. The most damning piece of evidence by far is this. 
This right here is a character class system. The game attempts to justify this by saying that the authority, the bad guys, are on the hunt for ARC survivors and so you have to put on some new clothes so they cannot find you via your ARC suit that for some reason has fingerless gloves, but whatever. These clothing options are a rudimentary character class system that has absolutely no appreciable impact on the gameplay and is never brought up again. Had Rage been completed as an MMO, would it have been any good, and would it have managed to put even the tiniest dent in the mighty colossus that is World of Warcraft? It's in my opinion that this game would have died within about two seconds upon release. There's just not enough here to make it worth paying a monthly subscription, the story is not all that engaging, and the gameplay, while not bad in first person shooter form, would likely have been very tedious in MMO form. Had they stripped out all the MMO crap and put in more money into the first person shooter elements, this game would actually have been pretty okay. The story is still extremely derivative, but the levels are good, the gameplay is fun, and if there was just more gameplay cowbell, you would have a fairly mid-tier first person shooter. It certainly wouldn't get the same notoriety as all the other id software games, but it definitely would have become a cult classic had it been just a first person shooter. But alas, that was not to be. The graphics look like the backside of a diseased wampa. Look at this. 2011, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, and that frame rate? Th th this is being run on a fully modern machine that can run Doom Eternal maxed out 60 FPS 2K. I get frame drops on the driving segments all the goddamn time. But at least the texture pop-in isn't so bad, and I only had one crash to desktop. In 2011, this game ran even worse, and would barely run on an AMD card. And at that time, all there was to record games was fraps. And you guessed it, the game didn't work with it. Then there were issues with textures not displaying properly, and one needed to create a texture folder so that the game would render maxed out. As of 2020, when I recorded this gameplay footage, the game displayed the textures correctly. This texture work looks substantially worse than the textures in the previous year's AVP game. And before I get any comments saying, no, General, those textures still aren't working, I checked. This is as good as it gets. And I feel that this lends more towards my MMO theory. MMOs in general have fairly weak graphics due to needing to be always online, and they generally need textures to be compressed and uncompressed as you travel to different areas. I get the feeling that this game runs like such crap due to using an MMO engine being Frankensteined into something for a single player game. Once again, if this doesn't hold water, then this is just a really crappily written game engine. Surprisingly, the levels aren't that bad. There are wide open levels to be found, and while there are a few arenas here and there, they are thankfully very rare. But when they rear their ugly head, they can be rather lazy. Oh, so lazy. But all told, when the levels get good, they can be a light in the dark. This game received much praise for its very fluid animations. Yeah, they look okay, but this is way overboard and it looks really silly and ruins what little immersion there was to begin with. The music for the game is so 2010. Just boring. Got a generic crap that is forgotten the moment one hears it. Quite sad seeing as how id Software created two of the greatest game soundtracks of all time. But it was 2011 and everything had to sound like it was in a film. Even when the plot was something that Asylum would say needed work. Be careful, be careful. Don't even tell me I need a dedicated sound card. I can live without the sweet nothings of rage tickling my ear. The sound is garbage. It drops out all the time when you're driving around. None of the weapons sound the slightest bit powerful. The enemies are neither scary nor cool. And the VA work, John Goodman. 
Oh, fuck off, Roseanne. No one gives a crap about some celebrity voice actor that drops out of the game in five goddamn minutes. The rest of the voice acting is 100% mediocre. Even Stephen Blum sounds like he's phoning it in. The British enemies sound the worst by far. I can't tell if it's Americans trying to do an accent or it's some crappy chavs acting chavily. The mob boss here sounds pretty good and is one of the few good performers to be found. Too bad he is just as insubstantial as the rest of the game. The story for Rage ticks all the boxes of the MMO. You play as one of countless people that could be the protagonist. You have some sort of special ability that makes you better than everyone else. And you play a very insubstantial role in the game story because you are supposed to be in a game with a crap ton of other people. So the story for this game is the most generic thing since EA. Scratch that. Even Electronic Arts does better than this most of the time. So, how do you make a Fallout slash Borderlands MMO? Well first, you gotta have that desert slash lived in landscape of Borderlands with the post-apocalypse of the Fallout series. So what do you do? You drop a big old rock and be done with it. Here we have a Apophis, the fiendish Goa Old, smashes into the earth, killing most of humanity. But thankfully, humanity had enough warning to create arcs, uh, I mean vaults, wait no. Arcs, arcs, there we go. To house the best and brightest, and you, the player, are one such best and brightest. You are awoken into the wasteland of the asteroid ravaged future. You create your character, I mean, uh, I mean, leave the Ark, only to be attacked by a trash mob, and then rescued by John Goodman! Gotta show off that money! This game would have been better served by letting you kill a few muties and then getting rescued by John Goodman, thus letting the player get hooked by the gameplay, but whatever, John Goodman. John Goodman gives you some scut quests for you to do and learn the lay of the land. There are remnants of factions from when the game was an MMO. I mean, factions that play no real role at all in the game story, but are there for XP that isn't there anymore. After the scut work, you go to the town of Good Springs, or I mean, Well Springs. You get to Red Run and the mayor gives you more scut work. It's a long bloody time before anything resembling a plot actually starts up. And uh, stop me if you've heard this one before. So like, you know, there's this faction, you know, they're, they're like out somewhere, right? And like they're evil US government people and they kidnap, you know, innocent settlers and like they experiment on them to take over the world. Oh wait, they have pretty much taken it over already. I guess. And it's up for you to stop them. Maybe. You get introduced to the Enclave, I mean, uh, Authority, way late into your scut work quests. You know, I would be contrite if I didn't talk about that Feltrite. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? This is actually a re-record. I just realized that contrite rhymes with Feltrite. Truly, I'm the greatest comedic writer of our time. Feltrite is the game's demoted premium currency. It plays no role whatsoever in the game, but a few quests treat it like it's important, and then it's dropped at the end, which of course makes very little sense. The game also treats it like it's new, even though it apparently has been around since the asteroid hit, but whatever. If they don't want to try, then I won't either. You get introduced to the Resistance, no, I mean, um, the Resistance before Last Jedi, by engaging in an epic battle against the Authority, wherein you rescue one of their number. Or actually, a dude tells you that they have it on good authority, that, you know, the Resistance is good, and the Authority, bad. You do more crap work for a Resistance member, and then you rescue Steven Blum, and move on to New Vegas, I mean, Subway City. This is a kind of cool scene here, wherein you and Stephen Blum ride an airship, and I want to make a joke that it's so overt, it's covert, and that no one would expect it. But that's too much e for for a game of such lackadaisical quality. You make it to Subway New Vegas City and do more crap work. Is there a plot other than not to die? I don't know. Is there a villain other than, you know, generic bad guys? And is there anything more to life than just doing thrice damn scut work? A new. The Resistance is made up of this one room and these few guys, but you're told that there are other rooms with fabled other guys. And you hear about a General Cross, but you never see him, or fight him, or interact with him in any way. He's just mentioned as the bad guy, and promptly forgotten. And then, you know what, you rock off with the devil is, if you guess gut work, you would be right. And you know what you'd also be doing? You'd be playing this Abaddon's lunch of a game. 
Wait, would a Chaos Commander need to eat? Yeah, oh, well, this game ate my soul. You kill a few baddies, fight in an arena crappier than the worst area in Doom 2016, and, well, you complete your epic mission of raising all the arcs around the world and saving the day, I guess. I guess, I'm not really sure. The game does say that there were resistance forces around the world to save the Vark, I mean, um, Vault Dwellers, Ark Dwellers, I don't care. But we never see them. And, you know, this right here is our ending. A door opens and cut to black. Oh my god! This was a howler of a game. And before anyone gets on me about, oh, there was a book written for the game, and it might explain more. This game came out in 2011. The idea that the book is supposed to fill in ideas that the game couldn't get across, well, here's a problem with that. That became obsolete around 1998. So that does not help this game's case at all. And besides, I read about a quarter of that thing and thought it was absolute crap. The writing was so pedestrian it made Dean Koontz look halfway decent. Personally, I despise reviewing bad games. I really do. I like telling y'all about great games, or why a well-known game is great. But I went through this torture as a public service announcement, mainly because I started this game not thinking it was going to be good, then it started getting just good enough that I was like, oh, the game isn't that bad. Why did everyone hate it? Then I continued playing it, and it got worse. And I was like, well, you know, maybe it'll pick up at the end. And then I got the ending and realized that I spent the entire game completing a bunch of goddamn fetch quests for assholes. And that I, the player, accomplished nothing in this bloody game. And this game is a lot like that apple that you eat that tastes just good enough to eat, but when you get done, you realize you just forced yourself to eat literal garbage. This game is the worst id software game of all time. Not because it's broken or something as bad as Extreme Paint Brawl. Its gameplay is fun enough, but it's ultimately unsatisfying. And I think that is the worst aspect of Rage. Colonial Marines is bad, but at least you can make fun of it. At least there's enough there that you can laugh at it. With Rage, there's nothing to laugh at. It's almost a tolerable game. And when something's just almost tolerable, what can you make fun of? What can you laugh at? What can you have fun with? Ultimately, this game needed to be reviewed because it's a stealth bad game. It's just good enough that you keep playing and then when you finally are done with it, you realize you just wasted your life. Its story is nothing more than the tattered remnants of a theoretical MMO and the whole game stinks of a project gone bad. Haha, you thought I was finished. I will say this though, this game is still much, much better than Duke Nukem Forever and its horrible DLC, Duke Nukem the Doctor Who Cloned Me. At the very least, Rage isn't horribly unpleasant in that it feels like it's nothing more than hallways and cutscenes. Haha, you thought I was extra done when I mentioned Duke Nukem Forever. I will add one aspect more to the game's good points. Lusum Hagger is really, really hot. That's it. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I have to say that I in no way recommend Rage to anyone! Don't even get it for the lols, because there's not enough there to actually mock. This is not bad in the good way like Sonic 06 or Road to Hell. This is just the bad kind of bad that leaves you disappointed when you finish playing it. It's just sad that id Software misstepped this much. Is Rage 2 any better? Well, I have absolutely no idea, and I don't plan on learning if it's any better until far, far in the future. For now, though, ladies and gentlemen, I am General Otz, and I'm going to wish you a much better AVP 2010, and a way, way better Wolfenstein 2009, or whatever makes you happy. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing, and if you can, please consider supporting me on Patreon so that I can continue bringing you this great content.